we are going to get started right away because we are on a very tight schedule. So we're going to start with our designers first, and we're going to give you a couple minutes just to introduce yourself. So Elena, you're first. All right, thanks. Hi, I'm Elena Capra. I'm an interior designer as well as a certified master kitchen and bath designer. Um, I do residential projects, also small commercial. My firm is based in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I work in South Florida primarily, but I also work in other areas of the country. I've worked in New York, Arizona, Minnesota, California, Massachusetts, a little everything. Nice. All right, Corey. I'm Corey Claussen. I own my own little firm in Vancouver, British Columbia. I'm a certified master kitchen and bath designer, as well as some other things that you heard. I also am um, faculty member part-time at an adjunct college. Uh, we work across the lower mainland of Vancouver, as well as anywhere we can in Canada. <laughs> Wonderful. Canada in the house. Love it. <laughs> Sean, our lawyer's back there over there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sean Kolich. I'm a former physics professor who became a lawyer about 15 years ago. And I specialize in helping clients obtain and enforce their intellectual property rights around the world. Um, TJ and I spun off our own law firm a year or so ago, and we have clients all over the United States and the world out of our office, which is based in Portland, Oregon. Nice. TJ, do you want to add anything? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm TJ Romano. Um, one of my expertise is in branding, uh, intellectual property counseling in general. So yeah, very happy to be a part of this panel. Wonderful. So we are going to start the discussion with the two designers. And Elena, we're going to start with you first. Corey, you're going to get the exact same question. Mm. So when you start working with a client, there's a contract in place. Can you give us an example of when you may not have had an ironclad contract and something went amiss? OK, so um, I'm gonna get, it's sort of a general example because it's over the course of my career, obviously, as we build our business as designers, you see things and you modify your contract accordingly after things happen. And you're like, oh, I probably need to make sure that doesn't happen again. Um, I think for me, a big thing is um, in the purchasing part of the contracts, sometimes um, you may have a client per se, they might have a family member that's in the cabinetry business or whatever. And so they might be purchasing a large part of some of the things that you're providing, but in your contract, if you don't have the very specifics about the purchasing and if it needs to come from your company or, you know, maximizing your profit as a business, if they are going to be purchasing, you might need to know all this ahead of time so you could adjust the contract accordingly to make sure it's fair for everyone, you right. know, that the client is able to, you know, get the deals that they feel need be and then that you're covered for the time that you put into the project. Right. And compensated. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. That's compensated. a big Compensated. Money, money. Corey, what about you? Has there ever been a time where you have dealt with a situation where maybe you didn't have an ironclad contract and something happened? Well, um, I will say recently I've learned it doesn't matter how ironclad it is. If, if you're going to have an issue, you're going to have an issue. Someone's going to raise something, they're going to bring it to whoever that might be, and they're going to try to get money out of you. So it doesn't really matter if your co uh, contract is ironclad or not. What matters is if, you're, if you've done your due diligence, if you've kept all your notes about every single meeting, whether your agreement says uh, something about termination and what the penalty is for termination, as well as the time scale and what is to be paid when. Those are the big ones. Big ones, okay. That's kind of the gloss over. Yeah, <laughs> the Coles Notes version. What I learned when I first started versus what we do now. Right. <laughs> I feel like it's forever evolving. As the longer you're in business, yes. the more you see, the more, all, and no project is alike. Right, and yeah. like you said, you might have something that happened at this project and you think, ooh, I am going to protect myself so this does not happen in any other project moving forward. Yes. Absolutely. So I'm going to stick with you guys for just one more question, then we'll hop over to the lawyers. How do you maintain, so let's say something has gone awry or the client is questioning you and your contract, how do you maintain that positive relationship? Because sometimes your inside voice has to stay tucked down and private, and you have to be professional. How do you deal with those situations? Um, so, well, do you want, to go, ahead? Oh, you go want ahead. me to go first? Go, go, well, you can go first. If you would like me to shake first. <laughs> okay, I'll That's go first. That's so Canadian. <laughs> um, sorry, you first, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, well, well, now what I believe mostly about this particular question is there's not a lot uh, that you can do to prevent 
much of anything with anybody. If you're going to have a crazy, you're going to have a crazy. It just, it's not, that nothing can prevent you from that. What can prevent you is a clear and honest, transparent conversation and meeting personally with your new customer or your client and reviewing every single line item of your agreement and asking if there's questions. By sending them just the documentation and expecting them to understand and send it back, that I find is the biggest failure. Uh, and it doesn't practice due diligence, does it, gentlemen? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Elena, do you have something else yes. to add? Sure. Um, Corey, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. I really feel like sometimes people might not always get into the details, and it's great to, um, of course, go over that with your clients specifically, because again, it could be different for each project. But a lot of the times, if there is an issue that comes up, and again, sometimes the contract does protect us, and we're not necessarily um, at, at fault, but even when things come up, I always find it's best to try to kind of diffuse the situation with the client direct, meet talk about it, figure out a working solution, because sometimes being able to do that is way more, you know, again, sometimes it might involve us taking care of something that necessarily, they might have signed off, but still we are trying to, to help the situation because sometimes the bad press or the bad, you know, referrals down the line, I always like to try to be able to come to a conclusion. It's not gonna be maybe every situation, right. but the best to just kind of be, again, transparent, talk to the client and, and come to a, a concise agreement and a fair agreement for both parties. Right. And, and in, Sorry, nope. would you say that your agreement is kind of your standard bones and that the proposal is what's flexible? I, I think that's a good, yeah, yeah, yes, absolutely. And in this day and age, if there is a disagreement or there's questions about the contract, don't do this, do this, and do this. Yeah, face to face. <laughs> face to face. Face to face. Cle that, <laughs> You can save yourself a lot of time and money by explaining something face to face rather than texting back and forth. We don't text as a practice. It just doesn't. It doesn't work. Words don't communicate correctly sometimes. There's colloquialisms in there that don't often give the right interpretation. So when we have a, a questionable or about a term or a policy or an issue. That is a face-to-face -face meeting. That's the first thing that happens. It doesn't matter what's in your day. You clear your schedule, you go. Right. Oh. And sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes nope. you got to pull on your big boy pants and your big girl pants, and but you do have to get it done. Someone else's pants. Yes, someone else's pants. <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> All right, lawyer time. Here we go. So you heard some of the situations. So we're actually talking almost pre-work, having these contracts in place, having your uh, systems in place. Ha as lawyers, have you come across this with designers that have, that don't have an ironclad contract and, and are there certain things that you see that they are missing? Well, we come across it in every field, uh, including this one. And uh, there's a certain amount of cynicism here to my left, especially for a Canadian about, uh, <laughs> about uh, legal agreements. I'm not sure what experiences you've had, Corey, huh. that have uh, instilled that. But um, from our perspective, What's crucial is to have a meeting of the minds about the agreement, um, which I think the best practice is to make that separate from the actual contract. And so I advocate with my clients essentially a two-step um, agreement process. Step one is at a term sheet level. And that's where you're actually talking about what each person, each party to this contract will come out of it with. What are your rights going to be? What are your benefits going to be? And it's in plain English. It's a normal conversation. You don't need a lawyer for that. Um, you may want a lawyer involved or looking at it from your side, but the main thing is to just have that conversation. I think Corey's absolutely right. It's very important to, to do that and not skip over and go straight into a legal document, which non-lawyers may very well not understand completely um, or may not even read, frankly, as you all know. So um, if you can get to a term sheet level agreement on the basics of the relationship, then the only other step is you need a good attorney to put that into proper form. And the other party should have their own attorney reviewing that. And so the ideal process is meeting of the minds, perfection of that agreement into a written contract with legal review on both sides. Does that happen? Yes, but not all the time, obviously. And when it doesn't, that's when I see problems. And I've seen it with designers, and I've seen it with every other uh, field. 
Do you want to add anything? Yeah, I, I think contract negotiations are your first opportunity to really um, have a, a dialogue with the other side and see are they going to be a good business partner for you. Mm -hmm. um, I think that every relationship is different. Uh, the key word is relationship, and I think contract negotiations is a really good way to gauge who you're going to be working with. If you see red flags right away, well, that should tell you something that uh, the, the relationship may be difficult uh, throughout. Uh, and so the other part about contracts, it's not a magic document. Um, ironclad, I think, is the wrong word. I think it's a flexible document. Everything's negotiable. Every term is negotiable, and every deal is different. Um, and I think that's part of the meeting of the mind. You, uh, I think you have to have an attorney who understands business and business risk. Uh, because if you're negotiating, for example, with a Fortune 100, it's going to be different than if you're negotiating with a small business down the street. What you can get in your contract is going to be different. Uh, and, and part of that is just understanding um, your bargaining power and being realistic and having an attorney that can counsel you through those moments and, and say, you know, like, let's not get hung up on this particular term. Uh, if you really want to have this business, you're going to have to yield uh, and understand what that means. And sometimes you just have to be flexible. Um, so I think that's, that's the main thing is that there is no such thing as an ironclad contract and every deal is different. I think it's dangerous to think you can have an attorney review a document once and you're all set. Um, the relationship that you're in with uh, it all depends on which side of the table you're on. Are you the, are you the independent contractor in the deal or are you the company hiring an independent contractor? You're going to be looking at a contract in two different ways. Mm -hmm. um, so I think all, it's very important to just take this process serious and that's why t uh, the term sheet is a really good opportunity to speak in plain English to your attorneys mm -hmm. as well and make sure you're understanding what your deal is. And that, I think that's so important because yeah. as a designer, if you don't understand what you're presenting to the client? How can you how can you present it? There, you you're gonna look like you're gonna look like a fake. Actually, <laughs> you're gonna look like you're not you don't know what you're doing, and you're going to not look professional. And I think a contract also makes designers look professional that they're protecting themselves and protecting their clients because the contract is there for both the client and the designer. I believe absolutely. Okay, all right. So, sticking with the lawyers for one last question in this first part. What are the most common contract complications that you that may not be directly to a design build project? So, for example, trademark or patent law or those type of things. Have you ever dealt with those situations? I have. Um, for me, the most common scenario in this field is working with architects where they are commissioned to design a work and a question comes up later about who owns different aspects of the design. Does the architect have the right now to build that structure again for somebody else? Or did the client actually gain ownership of the design itself along with the architect's services? And of course, that can only arise if there was no understanding of that in the contract. Mm -hmm. But I've seen that situation several times in my practice. And it can be very contentious because if it wasn't discussed, both parties may come to that um, relationship assuming that they own the design and the uh, person who paid for the services may be extremely upset at the prospect of someone else living in the same house, potentially in their own neighborhood. And um, so that's for me the, the biggest example that I've encountered specifically in this field. Mm -hmm. Do, I'm gonna put you on the spot, sorry. Mm -hmm. Sorry designers. <laughs> have, have you ever come across that where you've designed something specifically for a client um, and they believe the design, they own the design. So let's say it's a builder and you've designed a townhouse project and then there hasn't been anything in the contract and they're using it for multiple developments. Has that ever happened? I haven't had that happen to Corey? me, no. I, I can't say I've had that happen, but I do have a term in my contract that specifies that I own the document itself. They own the, they own the result of the work but the actual copyright is retained by me, by you. the design itself, and it cannot be replicated for anything other than the project stated at the address in right. the agreement. Is that <laughs> worded right? Uh, I'd like to see it. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm Fair paraphrasing. Enough. <laughs> My lawyers did draft that up, but okay. yeah, it's, it's paraphrased in it's some paraphrased. way. Okay. TJ, do you have anything to add on this one? Yeah, I think uh, one big issue I see as a recurring theme uh, especially with independent contractors developing uh, 
creating work. So whether it's a copyrightable work or a brand or something that you can protect with a patent, whether it's a design patent or a functional patent, is the concept of a warranty. Um, once in a while, I see these warranties that a, 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 a company will ask their independent contractor to warrant that they're providing a work that's not infringing, a third party right. And I think that's really dangerous. Um, and, and I think that's something that once in a while gets glossed over in contracts. But if you're providing a warranty, you're basically putting yourself on the hook that if there's an issue with something you create and there's a lawsuit filed, that you're on the hook. You're liable for damages. Um, and, I, and I think that that's something you really have to think through. Why, why is that there? Um, I mean, and those are all worded differently. Those warranties can be, I, you know, I actually knew of a problem versus any problem that results, as if you're an attorney supposed to be doing the clearance work. So, I, I mean, in addition to ownership, I see these, these intellectual property warranty of non-infringement is another issue that is a recurring theme of trying, you know, I, after the fact, we're right. trying to get people out of these, you know, these contracts. <laughs> right. Very good points, very yeah. good points. Okay, so we're gonna do a little segue. So that first part was, was more on the, your contract going into the design relationship with the client. So now we're gonna talk about after. You've worked your butts off, the design is gorgeous, you got it professionally ph photographed, and now how do you protect that? So we've got things like photography rights, fair usage, knockoffs, intellectual property. Corey, we're starting this one off with you, my friend. Oh, great. What steps have you personally taken to protect your designs and or your photographs that you have paid for to be professionally taken? Well, I think there's three steps here. One is the agreement itself has a copyright statement in it. Then the project documents have another copyright statement on every single page. It doesn't matter if it's a sketch or anything. There's usually a copyright symbol and my name on it. Uh, then the last part is really about photo photography and the way that um, Canada works on photography is the photographer actually retains all rights and it doesn't matter who hired the photographer or who paid the photographer, but the photographer can release their rights to the business owner who paid for the photography and you need to have that document uh, set up. The part that we're probably really asking about is Instagram and sharing inspiration photos from other designers. Yeah. And as a, uh, if you read Instagram's terms, that's actually prohibited, number one. Uh, so the way that I protect myself is I do do a reverse Google image search for my work periodically throughout the year, usually spring and fall. And I will select images that have had the highest likes on my Instagram. Um, if I do find my work on another website, unfortunately, it is either report it to Instagram or to the website, they will get a cease and desist order um, to remove that, that image with, because they haven't paid me for my work. That photograph is still my work. Mm -hmm. I own the rights to that. Mm -hmm. And if you would like to use it, you can certainly have a conversation with me mm -hmm. and we can draw up a term. Bullet points is usually the way it works, right? Uh, but there has to be a payment there as well. I worked hard for that photography. I didn't get paid by the client to do that photography. That's me doing that for my own advertising and um, I should be remunerated. Right, okay. Elena, what about you? How do you protect your designs and or photography of your work? Well, for, uh, in, for my work, I, I like to share it. I mean, we all like to share our stuff that helps us build our brand, that helps us build our business. So, um, and when it, and it comes to things like social media and Instagram and whatnot, there's one side of it where, you know, I put it out there for it to be shared and, and shared with the credit to me. Um, and I haven't, luckily they have not had experiences where it has been, it's only made me a handful where I've noticed it being used without credit or whatnot. And then I usually will message and, you know, show that I, a screen capture from my website that this is my work and you know could you and it's I, I have had where it was then in turn credited and whatnot and on the flip side of that it has helped me grow my business a bit as well I was able to gain a lot of my following from it being shared from either brands or, or certain influencers or whatnot so I am I'm grateful for that aspect of it but I definitely know there is another side of it where it's like we want our work to be credited to us and we own mm -hmm. the rights to that right so the big social media game that the whole 
do you, for new designers, especially who may or may not have uh, a, good, um, a substantial portfolio to share, a lot of times on Instagram or Facebook, you will see designers sharing somebody else's work. We're not going to talk about the ones who don't give credit. We're going to talk about the ones who do give credit to the designer. I'm going to ask personal opinions. And pers you're allowed to have your personal opinion because, hey, we're in North America. We can say what we feel, and, and we're allowed to have that opinion. So I'm going to ask both of you your personal opinion. I think I already know the answer. How, how do you feel about other designers sharing your work on social media and giving credit for it? I, I personally, I don't mind it. I think it's a good thing. I think when stuff is put out there and you are credited, it brings it back to you at some point. If someone else is going to share my work uh, in terms of uh, more of inspiration, I don't mind. If someone is looking to hire me, I don't really get most of my clients through social media. I get my clients through referral base, through existing clients and, and whatnot. So for me, that just helps keep it out there, put it out there, um, grow the brand. So I, I don't mind it in that respect. I think it's, it's totally fine because they're not looking to hire the person who's posted it if they like the work. So right. I, think, I think it's a good thing. I think there's positives to it. So on that side, the positivity of that is it helps grow. Right. And Corey? Well, I think appropriation of someone else's work is a highly contentious topic. <laughs> Therefore, that's uh, why my, we're talking about it. <laughs> my personal opinion comes down to ethics and who you are. If you don't want something stolen from you, don't steal from someone else. Mm -hmm. Interesting. It's just that simple. Yeah. Black and white for you. Yeah. I, ask, ask permission. Mm -hmm. You may or may not get it. Right. That's step number one. Then if you do get it, what are the terms around that permission? And yeah, I've had some pretty contentious issues with my work being shared by brands that I didn't ask for mm -hmm. or they didn't contact me about. And I, I can see Elena's point on this completely. Mm -hmm. It's just a difference of opinion. Right. Yeah, and we're allowed to have that. Mm. So heading over to the lawyers over there, Sean and TJ, have you ever dealt, like Corey brought up the, the topic of, well, not the topic, but he used the term cease and desist. Now, do you do that letter, Corey, on your own, or do you have your lawyer send that on I behalf? have a template letter, letter that I had prepared by a lawyer okay. uh, that I just fill in the details, and it gets mailed to them by registered letter. Okay. So, Sean and TJ, have you had law uh, lawyers? Have you had <laughs> have you had designers contact you regarding whether it's through social media, whether it's through a brand that has maybe used an image they didn't ask permission for, or someone has used their photos on their own website claiming it's their own work? Have you had any of that? Yes, okay. a lot. Okay, so dish the facts. Yeah, it, it happens all the time. I think in our practice, you know, again. Bear in mind that working with designers is a small sliver of, of the people we work with, so it hasn't happened frequently in this field, but it happens with our clients constantly, in fact. And um, it's a big uh, problem for a lot of companies to um, control the commercial use of their images, trademarks, and so forth by others. And it's exactly for the same reasons as it is for designers. Um, I think that uh, these two have, have almost uh, spanned the entire space of attitudes <laughs> right there. And I think it, it embodies uh, the crucial point, which is if a third party is using your image or trademark or whatnot in a way that benefits you, then why would you object, right? It's, it's not worth it, and it's, and it's very possibly not illegal either, because if they're not getting any commercial benefit and you're not sustaining any loss, then it's probably not protected by the law. It, there could be fair use in that situation. Um, on the other hand, if a company is using an image of your design because it features their product and benefits them, that's clearly a commercial use of your intellectual property, and it should be stopped. And so you can see those uses across that entire spectrum, and our job is to help our clients understand where to draw the line on enforcement in those situations. TJ, do you have things to add? Yeah, I was going to speak more practically to cease and desist letters um, or just the concept of enforcement. Um, nobody likes getting a letter from a lawyer. Um, I'm a lawyer, and I don't like getting letters from lawyers. <laughs> you know, so understand that uh, lawyering up it, uh, does have a visceral reaction uh, in a relationship. Um, I'm a big advocate of getting on the phone. I, I agree, don't do things over email. Don't 
tone is always lost over email. Uh, you can be very passionate and sit down and write something that you'll regret. Um, you know, step back. If you have a problem or you're in a dispute, just step back for a minute and then pick up the phone and call the person uh, before. You can ask your lawyer, call your lawyer, and hopefully your lawyer doesn't tell you that I'll fire out a letter. Uh, I, I would tell you to call the person first uh, and try to resolve the issue. And, and yeah, the lawyers, we're here. We, I mean, we deal with cease and desist letters all day long. We write them, we, we receive them, we review them. Um, <laughs> But generally speaking, uh, and, and oftentimes, the, the, the issue in that letter could have been resolved with a phone call instead of spending uh, $750 or $1,000 to have someone send a letter. So um, I, I just be practical. I think that's, that's the big thing. And, and have practical lawyers that, like I said, understand that it's a business relationship that you're trying to preserve. You know, lawyers, there are certain lawyers who just want to fight about everything, but that's not how um, you actually win in business. That's a Pyrrhic victory, <laughs> so oftentimes. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. And, yeah. and would you agree, that obviously, every situation is different Completely. when it comes to this? Completely. I, I mean, and there's egregious counterfeiting that goes on, and that's different. I mean, okay, that's when you lawyer up. If you have a counterfeiter ripping you off, yeah. that's different than someone who just made a mistake. Uh, attribution, someone puts uh, a fan. A fan puts up your work on Instagram. Um, doesn't understand what attribution means, doesn't mean to harm you, well, just don't, don't turn them into a PR nightmare for yourself by being too aggressive. Mm -hmm. Like I said, there are just ways, they're just people. There are people on the other side of all of these things and, and understand that you're a person, they're a person, and, and if you treat people, uh, at least make that initial attempt to just give them the benefit of the doubt, I think you'll get better results when, when you're enforcing your rights. Right, and or it's just all don't about- do it in the first place. The what? Or just don't do it in the first place. Well, people make mistakes. I mean, that's, no, that's, totally, yeah. totally, totally. I mean, there's, yeah. yes, there is usually an initial contact with me first. Yep. I will backpedal just a moment to explain that a little bit. <laughs> there will be an initial contact. I'll limit it to three days after that. Yep. Out goes the letter. I'm just yeah, tired just, of wasting my time. No, I get, I, it, I get it. I get it. So I'm interested um, because social media is ever evolving, ever changing. Are you seeing more and more of this these days? You're yes. shaking your head, yes. <laughs> yeah, these days with fan groups and, um, you know, user groups and all the platforms, um, you see companies whose trademarks and copyrighted images in particular are showing up in all these forums and, and frequently um, those forums splinter into commercial uh, ventures. You know, people that organize the forums or users on the forums, suddenly they're selling accessories that go with the target company's uh, products or services. And now they're using those images uh, that don't belong to them to promote their own brand. So yes, we see it more and more on, that plat on those platforms. Interesting, okay. So I know you're not a dentist, but you know how you go into the dentist office and a lot of people will start to do this because they sort of cringe what's going to happen to them in that chair. I'm not saying it's a parallel experience, but sometimes as a designer who is maybe new to the business, who has just graduated, seeing a lawyer could be stressful. It Listen, might be we, we, intimidating. We have a bar, a ping pong <laughs> yeah. table, and a shuffleboard. Oh. In our in our office, so we're not there to intimidate anyone. <laughs> we're probably reception? we're probably better dressed right now than we are for ninety five percent of our client meetings. So that's uh, good we're, we're to pretty know. down to earth. That's yeah. good we're to know. We're in Portland, remember? Uh, yes, yeah. I, I do remember you saying that. West Coast. But for a designer, when is the best time to reach out to a lawyer? Is it? before they start their business? Is it while they're in business? Is it, is it ever too late to contact a lawyer? Oh, definitely never too late, but the best time is uh, before they start the business. And this, the reason for that is not really what we're discussing so far, but they need to get some amount of due diligence on their company name and their brand before they launch anything commercially. Um, I, I'd say an even more frequent issue that we run into with small businesses than anything that's been discussed here today so far is the lack of proper clearance on a core trademark. And then that new business gets a lawyer letter from a third party's attorney saying, you're infringing our trademark rights. You've got to rebrand and maybe pay us a bunch of money on top of that. Um, that happens very commonly. And it's, it's very easy to avoid if you talk to a good trademark or intellectual property attorney before you start commercial activities. 
So that, I'd say that's the, that's the time to start. And if you do that, then you'll automatically have a, a relationship with the person that's going to be able to advise you as you start to develop contracts and run into all these other issues. So it should start as early as possible, but of course, better late than never. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think you can start at any time, but it, practically, if you're starting a business, talk to lawyers early. Build, build the relationship, uh, let them understand your business, let them understand your level of risk, um, and, and let them counsel you through uh, whatever business planning you're trying to do or what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, let, let them help you guide that ship. And then uh, as, you're, as your business is ongoing, you're, you know, you're gonna be checking with your lawyers a lot. Contracts are very important. Um, hopefully that's one takeaway from all of this is, you know, th those are real documents that have real consequences if they're not done right. Uh, but, you, but you will develop an understanding. Uh, I think that's the thing. It seems daunting at first. There's a lot of moving pieces uh, when you start a business. I mean, Sean and I just started our law firm. Uh, we broke off from our former firm and started 14 months ago. So we understand what it's like to be an entrepreneur and a small business owner. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we get that. But, but this part of it's really important. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, understanding that even if you have a lawyer review a contract, it's not a one-size-fits-all document. You know, that's why don't, don't just take that and use it forever. Uh, you, you're going to want to ch check in uh, periodically as, a, 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 you know, as, as you understand how negotiations go with uh, different companies because uh, that document will evolve. And when you say check in periodically, is it quarterly? Is it, does that change? I, I, I usually say before you sign a contract, you should check with your attorney. You know, send them the document, even if it's for 10 minutes to take a look at, even if it's right. something you had signed previously. Uh, make sure that's the appropriate document for that n next relationship. Right. Um, so I think any time before you sign, you shouldn't sign anything that's a legal document without checking with your attorney, with the exception of maybe you know real estate documents for purchasing a house because there's nothing else we can do with those. <laughs> um, but but beyond that, I mean you know any any document you're signing on behalf of your business, non-disclosure agreements. I, I just will want to flag this. They're the most dangerous document you'll ever sign. Um, it, usually it, they're circulated among lower level folks. No one really knows what's in them. They just see the title. It says non-disclosure. Uh, people that sign them, they don't even know what's in there. Sometimes you're signing all of your intellectual property rights away. <laughs> you know, it's part of, part of that document. Uh, sometimes you think you're uh, signing a document that's going to protect you, but it's a one-way non-disclosure. It only protects the other party's disclosure. Right. Um, and so any document like that has significant consequences if, if, if you're not having a proper review of that. And sometimes you're agreeing n never to use some technology or idea that you already had in your possession before you even talked to that person by signing the NDA. Um, I did not know this. It, that can happen. And, and so, yeah, we both spent a, a good amount of time reviewing NDAs for our clients. And they, and they have Informative. some pretty messed up terms. Yes, sometimes. they do. They do. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to make one point, and, I, and I'm going there. My, my friends back home call me Frank because... I'm honest. In many of the design forms that I have been a part of, there's talk of, you know, where's the best place to do my own website? Where is the best place for me to do my own graphics? Yet, on the other side of that coin, they're the first to complain, and I'm just saying globally, they're the first to complain that we're not treated as professionals and, you know, the client doesn't want to pay the full price yet they're trying to find a deal for all the other things that go in their business. And if you have been here the whole time, I think one of the most largest takeaways is to not go to, I don't even know if there's a website called lawyer.com. There is. Legal oh, Zoom. there is? Leg LegalZoom is, is <laughs> one that's a do-it-yourself website. A, a do-it-yourself website. As TJ and Sean have pointedly said today, there's not a one contract that fits all. So if you're going to invest in your business, which Every one of you should be investing in your business. Uh, invest in lawyers for sure. Would you? Would you agree? A hundred percent. I think as a designer, and like you said, it's something that's going to constantly be evolving. As your business evolves, you might get a specific project where you're on a team, or um, just every contract might be different. You always want to check it out, protect yourselves. I think a lawyer and an accountant when you start your business, and it's intimidating. I, as someone, I started my business 11 years ago. When you're just starting out, there's times when you're like, oh, I'm not ready to be paying all these people yet sometimes, and that could be a conversation. But that is the most expensive mistake you could make, yeah. I think, as a designer. I think it's uh, insurance, not having your insurance set up before you open your door, and then not having the right agreements in place to do business. Mm -hmm. um, there's a little bit of a running joke that 
we talk about at my place is six out of the seven lawyers agree. So maybe that can give you a little insight <laughs> into the cynicism um, that, that I've had a lot of lawyer or litigator clients uh, most past the contract review test. Uh, so I felt like I was doing good. And then I said, hmm, maybe I just need an impartial opinion. And I've done that actually last year I did that for the fir really for the very first time fully, a full review of every single little detail. And I thought that that was super valuable. It didn't cost a lot, it was about 500 bucks, and that was about it. Very quick, yeah. Yeah. very straightforward, and it's not, it's not uh, a financial exposure, it's more of the other exposures that I was more worried about. Right. Okay, we have a couple minutes for questions. Does anyone have questions in the audience? Here comes a microphone. <laughs> Just scream. <laughs> there we go. That's better. Okay, this is really a question for the designers. Um, as we all know, m many clients will sign a contract without thoroughly reading much of it. Uh, how much time do you typically spend reading it aloud for them so that you're sure they understand it before they sign it? That's a good question. Who would like to answer that? Because I do that every single time, I know how long it takes. It's about 45 minutes. Um, and that's, that, I think, is the best 45 minutes that I could ever spend or ever give to a future client for free because they actually shouldn't pay for that part. Um, but. It is getting into the details and it's like, okay, so now I've gone through everything. Do you want to sign now? Are you comfortable? Or do you want to take this back? Mm -hmm. It's up to them. Elena, what about you? Yeah, absolutely. I, I review it with them usually in that meeting where we're going over it. Sometimes they may see the contract, call me up. It depends, you know, it's a different setting either way. But I always, especially when it comes to the purchasing, any markups, any specific things about the project, I want to make sure it's clear because I think that that ensures the, a successful project and it makes a lot of other things that could potentially go wrong. We know, okay, this is how it's going to happen if I purchase this or this is, there's, there's no questions. It's good. Is there any other questions in the audience? Don't be afraid. <laughs> so if I were to do a design for a contractor and I'm paid from the contractor to do the design, client pays him, whatever, do I have a contract with the client for the design or with the contractor? <laughs> Was that clear enough? I don't yeah. Know. Yeah. I, yeah. It's clear to me. It could be either way, I would say. I mean, it depends. Do you, is, does the client have a general contractor that's subcontracting out to you, in which case your contract is probably with the GC? Okay. Um, or if you're just one of many contractors hired by the client, then your contract is with the client. So I think it depends on the situation, but I don't think there's a right or a wrong there. Okay. But I do think you need to make that clear. Like, you need to know personally. Yeah. Am I contracted by the contractor or am I contracted by the client? Because that's two different that's two different roads, yeah. Yeah. in the, my opinion. Yeah. And, contracted and the ownership with, of your work will shift in that scenario, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. yeah. Well, also yeah. understand what happens if uh, payment's not being made in that chain. How does it affect you? Mm -hmm. I mean, who, who do you ultimately go oh. to if you have a problem getting paid? Okay, thank that's you. a really good point. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, there's one over here. There's a couple. Put your hands up nice and high. Hello. Um, we, um, I work on visualizations, 3D renderings for interior designers and architects. And um, I would like to know how you feel about uh, intellectual property when you provide all the floor plans and all the design information and a professional like me create an image out of that. Uh, kind of feel like we always are considered like less, we have less right on property than photographers for some reason. We actually, I was working with a large developer, directly with the developer, and we use the architecture, uh, the architect's information to create renderings, and I particularly published one of the renderings in my LinkedIn uh, in a private manner, and they actually sue, the architect sued my client 
for saying that the pro they uh, own the properties of the design when the rendering was uh, and the modeling of the, the the project was totally done by us. Um, we fortunately won, but um, but it was a really um, the, during that process was a lot of discovery and a lot of discussion, and there was no really uh, clear answers of who really owned mm -hmm. the the property of those images. Sean and TJ, how do you want to? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it comes back to the, the the issue of ownership, and this is the main issue that we always see. Uh, it's a pre-negotiated term. Uh, who owns what? Who owns your work? Do you own it? Do are you are you owning it and giving it a, a license for this project for uh, another company to use it, or are is the work that you're generating owned by another company? It really comes down to the contract term, um, and there is no right answer. I mean, if they pay you a dollar, maybe you want to still own it. If they're paying you a million dollars, okay, well let them own it. <laughs> you know, I think it really just that's what I mean. There is no one size fits all, but it really does come down to. Uh, the terms of the agreement and, and is there a meaning of a minds on those terms? But if there's no term about that and it's silent, then the creator of the work is the default owner in the US, just like in oh, Canada. Mm -hmm. And so you would own the renderings that you created, the architect would own the architectural drawings that the architect created, and you're each free to use those however you want if there's no agreement to the contrary. And that's probably why you won. And sir, can I ask, did you have a contract in place? No, we didn't no. have a contract okay. in place. Will you in, from this point forward? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about it. <laughs> There's two gentlemen you can talk to right here, right after the show. Uh, did you have a question in the back? Yeah. You talked a little bit about uh, the photography work. Um, and again, it kind of falls back to that same question that you just answered as far as who owns the rights. We like to, uh, when we work, we're a manufacturer, so when we work with designers, we like to give credits to use and help pay for the photography work, but we find more difficulty working with the photographer as far as giving up the rights to the photography work, and we find like if we put it in a brochure or we use it on social media, they're contacting us later and saying, well, you used it more often than what you asked for. And we don't really have control of that if a brochure goes over well and we reprint it or the social media goes over well and it, it gets used more often for more things. It, it, does that revert back to a contract and, and how it's written up? Absolutely. And, and my advice there, since you say you're a manufacturer, you've got... I disagree that you have no control over that. You've got plenty of leverage as the manufacturer hiring a photographer. You need a contract to present to photographers that says they assign their copyrights in those photographs to your company. And if they want to work for you as your photographer, that's what they have to accept. And then you can use them freely however you want. Now, you might pay, a, expect to pay a little bit more for that contract and those photographs than if it was um, retained by the photographer. But then you would have those problems that you're identifying. So uh, it's absolutely a contract provision, but without that provision, the photographer will remain the owner of those photographs and you'll be needing to ask. Mm -hmm. It's a really good question. We have time for one more. Uh, is there anyone else that has a question? Good questions, by the way. Yeah, great questions. <laughs> Could you discuss uh, intellectual property rights when it comes to work for hire versus spec. Yeah, uh, work for hire, you said work for hire, correct? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, work for hire is a term that's used in copyright law. It's got a very specific legal meaning and it's meant to cover certain situations where a contract is silent about copyright ownership. And specifically, if an employee creates copyrightable subject matter, I mean a W-2 employee, not a contractor, uh, creates copyrightable subject matter, whether it's photographs, drawings, whatever, for their employer, then in that situation, it's considered work for hire and the employer, rather than the creator of the work, is the default owner. Okay? Other than that, work for hire only applies to a very narrow subset of activities that uh, in this field you're unlikely ever to encounter. Uh, the main example is if you work on a movie, a motion picture, then even if you're a contractor working for a movie studio, that's considered a work for hire and the studio owns it. 
And you can imagine the studios lobbied Congress for that interpretation back when that law was enacted uh, into a statute. And there are a few other very, very narrow categories like that. But the main one is that uh, an employee is working for hire for the employer and giving up the copyrights. Um, other than that situation, you have to assign ownership separately in a contract provision if you want it to not remain with the creator. Yeah, I, the, the work made for hire language is one of the most misunderstood and dangerous terms in independent con contractor contracts. Um, it's sometimes uh, that language is there and, and a party thinks that they're getting all copyright rights assigned under this provision, but the provision is very narrow. It only applies in, in very, very narrow circumstances, most of which don't apply here. Right. Yes, employee, that's the one. Employees broad, right. So the, the employee work made for hire is a very broad provision. But subcontractor, very narrow. If you just yeah. say that something is yeah. a work for hire in a contract, it's meaningless. Yeah. Just saying that it is doesn't make it so. It's not. It, it only yeah. is, okay, yeah. Yeah, it's only a work yeah. for hire if it's an employee. And, and uh, so with, with, with contracts with independent contractors, you need to have a much more robust assignment provision of intellectual property rights that goes beyond that language. Yes. Yeah. And I think that question just solidifies involving a lawyer in your business, not making assumptions, and, and using a term that could be meaningless in one of your contracts because that could lead to problems down the road. Absolutely. All right, that was a quick that was a quick <sighs> session. It went very fast. I'd like to thank the two designers, Alina and Corey, and of course our two lawyers uh, at, on the end there, Sean and TJ. Um, fabulous information. I hope you got some nuggets. Before we go, though, I'm going to put all of you on the spot, and this is going to be like lightning speed. I'm asking you each two things, two pieces of advice that you would give for brand new designers or designers coming into the profession later on in life. Two pieces of advice. Go. Okay, so not every project you're going to take is going to be the same, and not every contract might be exactly the same. Consult with an attorney on whatever you need to if you are unsure, always. Um, document your client movements. Uh, what I mean by that is conversations uh, in meetings, telephone, and uh, any other written point. Record them somewhere in a process or a system that is accessible to you and them so that they understand what they talked about and that there's some sort of agreement between them. Okay. Uh, I would say clear your trademarks before you start to sell anything under a new brand. Make sure that that trademark is actually available so that you're not going to run into a problem, number one. And number two, um, try and get to a term sheet level understanding of the main points of a contract before you go straight into a legal agreement. Thanks. Uh, one, be pragmatic. Uh, it's business, you're making a business deal. So don't, don't let your contract get in the way of closing a deal. Um, and so the second part of that is uh, understand your terms, the, the main terms, but understand the difference between a deal breaker term and something you can live with. Um, and that's part of what the term sheet's gonna educate you about is what are your deal breaker terms and what can you live with? Uh, don't, don't take the fight on every term in a contract. You know, it's a, a, unless that's the kind of business person you are, that's fine. You're just sending a message to the other side that you're inflexible. Uh, and maybe that's okay. I mean, I mean that, that could be the message you wanna send, but. Uh, just understand what you're doing in a contract is reflecting your business re relationship. So give and take is a good thing. Nice. And so by the way, if there's any other questions, I'm ha I mean, yeah. there's a lot of folks here. I'm happy to stand to the side after this and answer any other questions. So. And how often do you get that? Yeah, free, free legal advice. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for stopping by. We hope you got some good nuggets of information, and uh, good luck, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.